are the Fed more afraid of a taper tantrum or are they more afraid of inflation? What does this mean for financial markets? And are we nearing a tipping point for gold and silver that could see prices rocket higher? For this and more, I'm joined by my guest this week on Goldcore TV, Lawrence Lepard of Equity Management Associates. And remember, if you want to see more interviews with thought leaders and industry experts, subscribe to Goldcore TV and hit the notification bell now. And if you want to see and learn more about how to buy, sell, and store physical gold and silver, log on to goldcore.com, your precious metals experts. Lance Lepard, welcome to Goldcore TV. Thank you very much, Dave. Nice to be with you. Now, I heard you recently say that the belief that we're going to return quickly to a deflationary environment is false. Tell me why it is that you think that. Well, I just think that, um, that we've turned the corner on this 40 years of deflation trend that everyone expects us to go back to. And uh, the, the evidence for that is just kind of overwhelming. Um, you know, you can't go any lower in terms of the interest rates. Many interest rates are negative. Um, and then we've got a lot of things that are happening that are massively inflationary, including the government actions, the shortages, the COVID lockdown, et cetera. And inflation is partly a psychological phenomena. You know, when people see the cost of everything going up, they want to be paid more. And so they demand higher wages and higher wages lead to higher costs and so on and so forth. So it becomes a vicious circle. And I think we've just turned the corner on that deflationary trend, which was in place for many, many years. And we're going in the other direction. And of course, the numbers support that too. I mean, we just wrote our quarterly report and you know, the, the CRB index, the broad commodity index is up 60% year mm. on year. That's, that's never happened before. <laughs> it's just, that's like outrageous. And you know, every consumer sees it in the supermarket, at the gas station, you know, wherever you want to be. And, and of course, the Federal Reserve and others have said because they need to and they have to, you know, kind of shade the truth. They've said, well, you know, um, it's all transitory based on COVID. But even they've begun to admit that that's, maybe it's not so transitory, that these problems are going to persist for several years. And so we, I believe that we've, we've turned the corner on the deflationary trend and that we are now in an inflationary environment. And, you know, it won't be immediate high inflation all the time necessarily. We're not necessarily going to a hyperinflationary condition. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, it'll be some form of inflation, sometimes pretty high, then it'll back off, then it'll be high again, back off. It's going to look more like the 70s, in my opinion. Does that mean now that the Fed are, have kind of painted themselves into a corner? Are they trapped? Because on yeah, the one hand... That's, you described it perfectly, and that's what we talked about in our quarterly letter, which is available on the web. I mean, they really are trapped. I mean, they don't have, you know, they... they because they, you know, their their mandate says they've got to try and get the economy growing, get full employment, keep things going on the up. Um, you know, if if they were, I mean, the obvious way to fight inflation, right? Is well, let's say they, you know, assume we're right and that there is inflation. Okay, start there. Um, how does the Fed fight inflation? Well, Volcker did it in the in the seventies. You know, you raise interest rates. Well, in a highly leveraged world like the one we're in today, if you raise interest rates, it's going to be a real problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, their growth is going to slow down, and people are going to get unemployed, and so on and so forth. So they. They really can't. They, the, the typical inflation solution is just not available to them in this in this climate because of the way the system has been set up. And so, you know, it's possible they'll try that. But if they do, we're going to have one heck of a recession. And um, and, you know, that's a possibility. But given what I've observed about the way that politicians in the United States and other places operate, you know, they're not going to want to do that. They would rather risk the inflation than raise interest rates and create the economic downturn, because in a severe downturn, they're all going to get thrown out of office. I was going to ask you then as a kind of follow up question is what, what are they more scared of inflation <laughs> or a taper tantrum? But you're kind of answering that and saying it's a, it's a taper tantrum. I think they're more scared of a taper tantrum. I mean, I think they can they'll lie about the inflation. And look, if everybody's working and the economy is kind of working and goods are flowing around, I mean, we'll all be bitching about inflation. But you know, that's better than if, if they go the other direction and do a severe taper and, you know, the, the, the market takes a header and everyone feels poor and, you know, we go into a hard deflationary environment, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be a real mess. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the bubble that we're in right now, in my opinion, is very, very large. It's, it's larger than the 2000 bubble and it's similar to the 1929 bubble. And if they, you know, if, when the, if, if this bubble in the stock market bursts, it's going to be a real problem for the economy because, 
you know, the, the stock market creates a lot of the, the wealth effect that keeps the economy running. And when everyone sees their, you know, their, their retirement accounts going down relentlessly, they're going to cut back on their spending and, and that's going to be very, very bad. And so you could have a, you could have a scenario that I think would actually rival the 1930s depression. Right. And uh, of course, no politician wants that. They know what that means for them. So uh, I think that, you know, inflation is kind of baked into the cake. Now, how it resolves and what the end point is, I think that's very uncertain. Um, and we all have to kind of do our best to, you know, to position ourselves for what we think might be coming. So back to the concept of them being painted into a corner, they can't really raise rates and even withdrawing liquidity from the market is a, has serious implications for them. And on the other hand, they have to be seen to be addressing inflation. So is it a case now that they can, all they can do is, is, is use their narrative and jawbone the market? And that's, that's what I believe to be the case. I think they're going to do that. I think maybe occasionally they'll tap the brakes. I mean, they've been tapping the brakes recently you know, with the talking about removing QE, which I think they'll have to ultimately reverse, but they could, they could start to taper QE. And as you notice in the US, you know, the Congress and, and so forth, I mean, uh, Senator Manchin and others have, have said, hey, look, we got to get this inflation under control. We got to stop this spending. So, you know, there was talk a year and a half ago that there was going to be a three and a half trillion dollar infrastructure bill. Well, that hasn't happened. Mm. And so, so there are people who are aware of the inflation risk and they're trying hard to prevent it from coming true. But you know, it, at the end of the day, I think that, you know, when, when push comes to shove, they will print and they will spend the money. I mean, it reminds me a lot of if you're around in 2008, you know, the, the financial system was crashing and they went to the Congress and they said, well, we need a 700 trillion or billion dollar bailout for TARP. Mm. And if you recall, the first time they put it up to the Congress, you know, it was overwhelmingly rejected. You know, what, what are you talking about? We're going to bail out the banks by giving them 700 billion? No way. Well, the next thing that happened is the market sold off hard. I mean, really hard when it got turned. And, and of course, you know, immediately, you know, a few weeks later, they brought the bill back and it went sailing through, mm -hmm. you know. So, I mean, nobody can really, nobody in the political arena can really handle, you know, the downturn that would come if they don't continue printing money. And therefore, I believe that, that that's our future. In the short term, then, I mean, I, I kind of sometimes look at uh, the Fed and their actions at the moment. Is, is there are some empty threats in there, like a, oh, yeah. a like like a parent threatening to cancel a vacation if kids don't behave? <laughs> right. Is there is is there a point in time where where the Fed have to actually do something, even if it's just minor, just to kind of reinforce a bit of credibility? Oh, I agree. Yes, yes, and I think it's possible. Like I say, I think they might actually go go forward a bit with this taper. Um, you know, I mean, look, the market's, the market's down, what, 5 6% off its high. I mean, you know, they could easily realize that, hey, you know what, to maintain credibility, we need to have a 15% correction. Mm. The problem is when something is, is as puffed up as this is, you know, a 15% correction could turn into a 30% correction really quickly. And so it's, it's a tricky game they're playing. If they want to go that route, you know, when it starts to go south on them, they're going to have to very quickly reverse. I mean, Recall, recall March and what happened in March of 2020 when COVID broke out, you know, they held off for quite a while on doing anything in terms of, you know, spending, growing their balance sheet, accommodation, whatever, and just because they wanted to see what happened. Well, then the market really started to tank and the bond market really started to tank. People started selling U.S. bonds, which has never happened before. Generally, their flight to safety goes to U.S. bonds. Mm. And, and when that occurred, you know, they, boy, they turned around and they came through with, you know, all guns blazing, right? I mean, you know, basically Jay Powell did a Mario Draghi and said, you know, we're going to do whatever it takes to turn this thing around, i.e. unlimited printing. And they rapidly, rapidly doubled their balance sheet. I mean, after the 2008 crisis, which was kind of an earlier version of this one, you know, they, they doubled their balance sheet, but it took them five, you know, three to four years. Here they've doubled their balance sheet in four months or, or a little over that. So, you know, yeah, they, you know, you're right. They, I mean, they'll, they'll head fake us and they're, you know, we don't know what they're going to do, right? I mean, their job is to try to hold it all together. But I tell you what, I like our cards a lot better than theirs. They, they got a, they're playing a losing hand. Um, and, the, and, and, and the tools that they're operating, they're trying to fine tune the economy um, and monetary right. policy with some very blunt instruments. That's right. And like and trying to operate with mittens on, really, isn't it? Yeah, that and it's also it's also just mathematical. I mean, yeah. it's not you know, they're, they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, I mean, it's like gravity. I mean, they're trying to fight something that's mathematically true, which is that if you grow, you know, if you grow the debt at a compound rate, that's ever increasing, 
eventually, you know, it becomes asymptotic, you know, it goes straight up and you just, you can't deal with it. I mean, go look at a chart of how the money supply has grown. I mean, the money supply, all the money in the United States, 40% of the money in the United States has been created in the last two years. That's nuts. Crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And so, you know, the, 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 the byline on Twitter, a lot of wags use this, you know, you can't taper a Ponzi. And, <laughs> and that, you know, there's, there's some truth to that. I mean, it's, it's, I think another really great analogy, a friend of mine uses, I just love it because it's, it's like, you know, the, 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 the economy is kind of like this heroin addict. It's just, you know, we, we just need heroin to keep going, man. We just, and, and you know what happens when you, with, when you eventually withdraw the heroin, you're going to crash hard, you know? And, and if you, you know, if you withdraw for too long and you don't reinsert it, you're going to totally crash and die. So, um, you know, and I don't know if there's a Narcan out there. I mean, we need Narcan, right? <laughs> <laughs> because, because it's, you know, it's going to be a problem. I mean, it's, you know, I think, unfortunately, we've reached the end of the road for these guys. I mean, and, and I say, unfortunately, just because societally, this is not going to be pretty. I mean, it's, and, and that's, of course, why we've all bought precious metals to protect ourselves and protect, you know, our savings, right? Well, with that, as you, as, as you bring that up, <sighs> precious metals, uh, we've had a great run up and we made a new yep. all-time high over $2,000. They've eased back since. Um, money printing has continued, but given the extent of the money printing that we have seen, logic would have suggested that gold and silver would have been significantly higher than they are now. Completely agree. And it's been Why terribly, yeah, it's been terribly frustrating. And I'll, uh, I'll write about that in my report. There are really two reasons for it. One, you know, all, all markets breathe. I mean, remember that we, we had a couple of very good years. I mean, 2019 gold was up 15%. You know, 2020 gold was up 25%, and the stocks, you know, more or less in the same time frame doubled. Okay, mm. um, so that was a lot. You know, and, and they anticipated it, right? Right after March 20 happened, they those metals completely saw it. They read it, and they they ran hard. You know what happened? And, and the market's always looking forward, right? They, they they topped last August, and you know whether they knew it or not, I think what they were anticipating was the fact that okay, the government's going to slow down on this money printing, and so let's back off and see where we are. So that's what happened. I would say there's a second reason, though, that I think most of your listeners are probably familiar with, and that is that they're manipulated. I mean, the you know the gold market is manipulated, the silver market is manipulated. It's manipulated by the Fed. It's manipulated by the bullion banks. It's manipulated by the BIS. And the reason for that is that it's a substitute for fiat currency, and they know that. And they know that if these things run away to the upside, they're going to have a fiat currency failure. And so they create paper, you know, silver and paper gold, and they introduce them into the marketplaces in big chunks at very inopportune times, like Sunday night in August, when they're able to take the gold price down $60, you know, by putting in a, a, a multi-billion dollar order when there's no buy, when there's no buyers. So, you know, there's, there's a piece of this market that's broken because of that manipulation. But the thing I would say to your readers that should be comforting is that manipulations fail. I mean, they, they always fail. Maybe not instantly, but they always do fail. I mean, the gold market was manipulated in the 60s. There was a London gold pool that was formed in 1961 and seven central banks who formed it. And up until you know 1966, they had the price of gold locked down at 35 bucks. And uh, because that was the standard and that was what the US was pegged to. After that, you know, they started losing control of it. The US went to London and said, hey, you got to shut this thing down. We got a serious problem here. And, and they did, and they lost control of it. And the, the the official price of gold was 35, but the, the market price was between 50 and 100. And then, of course, in 71, Nixon said, we can't handle this at all because you're draining all our gold. And he just shut the window. So but so so there was a, you know, the London gold pool was a $35 manipulation that lasted throughout a good part of the 60s, but it ultimately failed. And that's what's going to happen here. You know, there are, there are tons and tons of paper claims on gold. And, you know, more and more people are asking for the actual physical delivery. And as they do, I mean, they can print a paper claim on gold, but they can't print the real metal. And so as more and more people, you know, the way, the way to break the system is for people to buy coins or to buy bullion, you know, and, and, take, and take possession, right? Yeah. And that's happening. I mean, that's, that's happening because I think more and more people are seeing it. And all it's going to take is a couple of billionaires to say, you know what, this is complete fraud and, and ask for delivery on huge amounts of silver and gold. And, and the thing's going to blow up. And before we know it, gold's going to be at 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, because that's really where it should be if you were to parity price it against the, the money supply that's been created. 
Well, that's what we're seeing with respect to the uh, purchasing of physical. We're seeing that we're seeing gold, which which uh, historically would have been a little bit more of a fringe investment. It's coming more to the mainstream for for yeah. people, and they're looking to take that. They're looking to take the physical, and you can see it in in the likes of even say Wall Street silver, and the yeah. rise of the popularity and the understanding yeah. and the spreading of the information yeah. and the understanding of physical. Yeah. I think I think more and more people. It's all it's going to take is a is a groundswell of people. To, to know what, what I just told you and what you know about this manipulation. And they're just gonna say, hey, you know, just because it's not working now doesn't mean it's not going to work. 5,000 years of history says that these things are money and that this paper that's being created is, is just, it's funny money and it's gonna lose its value over time. I mean, you see it in other areas too. I mean, a good example, I don't know what's happened in Ireland, but the United States, you know, home prices year on year are up 23%. Yeah. So, and that's, that, that didn't happen in the housing bubble. I mean, that's enormous. Yeah. And the reason that's occurred is that people here have realized that a house is something that will hold its value and you can use it. And so, and, and furthermore, the government will let you borrow money for 30 years at 3%. Well, <laughs> that's a winning deal. I get an asset that's going to go up in value with inflation and I get to borrow money at 3%, which is way below the true rate of inflation. You know, that's, that's a good deal. And so as a result, you know, everybody and their brother has you know a lot of renters and others have realized hey better buy a bigger house better buy a house and so that's why the housing prices have been up so much i was going to ask you as a follow-up question there we were talking about gold and silver uh, uh, yeah. especially around the manipulation as to uh, when and how it how it ends and it's probably you probably already answered that and said it's it's uh, the time and the how is determined by this it's, it's more like a tipping point we're getting closer that's and closer exactly to right point. that's exactly right i look at it in a malcolm gladwell you know, it's when 10% or more of the population kind of realizes that inflation is a really serious problem. And holy crap, they got to get out of this cash. They got to stop saving in stocks, stocks and bonds. And they got to start saving in the form of something that's real, you know, because bonds actually going to be the biggest loser, right? I mean, in a huge inflationary environment, boy, a bond is just, it's just no good because, you know, we're going to see gasoline, petrol, as you guys would say, at multiples of today's price. And you know, a bond, you're going to get 3% rate of return every year and get it, or less at a tenure mm. and get it back and, you know, get your principal back in five years. Your principal is going to buy a fraction of what it bought before. I mean, a bond is like the worst investment ever, right? And so, no sense. And, and stocks will be too, because in the 70s, stocks really did poorly. Because what happens there is that all their, you know, they can't pass on all their costs. Their costs are going to go up. And we're at peak margins right now in the United States on all these stocks. They have huge, huge profit margins. Those are going to get squeezed like crazy. And so the margins get squeezed and then the multiples come down. It's a, the stock market right now, the general stock market right, right now, in my opinion, could easily lose 50% of its value in the next couple right. of years, easily. And so, you know, I recommend- In the, my next, client, couple of, in the next couple of years. Is it? In the next couple of years. I recommend okay. to my, my clients and my friends, you don't want to be in, you definitely don't want to be in bonds. You, you, you generally don't want to be in stocks. I mean, maybe some good ones that are, you know, there, there will be some that'll be okay. But in general, you don't want to be in stocks. And what you really want to be in are, are in various forms of sound money. And of course, the, the leading two are gold and silver. But I, I don't know how much your audience is familiar with it. But I actually am, I, I believe in Bitcoin. I actually think Bitcoin is, a, is an alternative form of sound money that, that, has, that has value and will survive. Bitcoin, I don't like has, the Bitcoin has been seen very much as kind of eating gold and silver's lunch over the last year. Yeah, or two. I mean, it's there's it, it does a little. I mean, look, there's room for both. I mean, you know, Bitcoin. So, so gold and silver are five year, five thousand year old, you know, analog sound money with no counterparty risk, right? And mm. and so I, you know, the way I look at it, what I tell my clients is, gold and silver are like your bonds. I mean, you're just you're not going to lose money. They're going to go up in value. They're solid. There's nothing, you know, once they've been mined, you know, they're, they're there, right? So that's, that's a very good place to have your capital. Um, Bitcoin, and, and I don't like any of the other cryptos. I only like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an emerging form of digital sound money. It actually is legitimate. I know some people in the gold community don't think it is, but I do. I think it will be an important sound money alternative to gold and silver. But it's very, very early in the whole adoption curve of it, which is both a risk and an opportunity. I mean, it, it will go up in value as more and more money gets printed and, get, and, and money in general gets debased. But it also, it's at one of those tipping points. Only about 10% of the people in the world now are into Bitcoin or own Bitcoin. And over time, you know, being able to move sums of money quickly over the web 
will be an important thing. And Bitcoin provides that. It also provides a fixed cap on issuance. So, and it's mathematically, you know, sound in that respect so that no government can, can, can mess with that. And so as a result, you know, it, it represents, in my opinion, you know, probably the fastest horse in the monetary debasement race. The only issue I have with it, or some people have with it, and, and rightly so, is that it's very volatile. And, you know, for, for widows and orphans, you don't necessarily want to be putting your money into something that can have an 85% drawdown, which, you know, it's had several of those. So, you know, it, because especially if you think you might sell at the bottom of the 85% drawdown. In other words, you have to take a long-term view of it. And it's, so to me, to me, Bitcoin is risk equity, risk equity sound money, and gold and silver are rock solid sound money. That's how I view it. Um, answer me this. If we haven't had the manipulation in gold and silver in the paper market over the last few years, given the excessive money printing that we've had, where would you expect gold and silver to be? So, selling? yeah, they'd be somewhere between five and $10,000 an ounce, maybe higher today. I mean, I to fully cover the United States monetary issuance to date with the gold that we theoretically hold in Fort Knox, and I think there's some argument about that, mm. um, gold would have to be $100,000 an ounce. <laughs> which is a really big number compared to 1800. Yeah. So it, it's stunning what they've been able to pull off. I mean, this is all in my annual or my quarterly report. You should, you know, we'll direct your readers to my website. They can print it down, read it. But um, yeah, so it's, it's been massively suppressed, just massively suppressed. And, uh, uh, but, you know, and, and I know a lot of people are like, well, but that'll never change. And, and there certainly is that possibility, but uh, that's not how I'm going to bet it. I mean, it has gone up very consistently at kind of nine, nine, nine and a half percent a year since 2000. So, you know, and that's better than the reported inflation. It's probably close to the real inflation over that time frame. So it has protected your purchasing power. Does that but, suggest, A, that um, the powers that be only have so much influence in terms of keeping a cap on the price? Or does it suggest that they're happy for it to appreciate at that level? That's a great question. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, I think, I think the powers that be are going to come to the realization that they better have inflation or else this whole thing is going to collapse. And so I think what the average American or world citizen ought to do is get used to living in a world with inflation, get, get, get used to the idea of inflation and so, and plan for it. Um, because I actually think they're going to have to let the gold price run. They're going to have to let the silver price run. They can't, you know, they, 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 they won't be able to issue enough paper to hold it down. And, um, and you know, at, at the end point of that whole thing, very similar to like 79, 80, when gold had run from $35 to $800, at the end point of that whole thing, I think we'll have a monetary reset and we'll either go back to a gold standard or some kind of something similar to that um, because people will be so fed up with inflation that they'll be just screaming for you know politicians who are willing to return to sound money, and all the existing politicians will be thrown out of office. But you know, as you and I both know, you know, given the age we're at and how we we watch things unfold, these things don't happen overnight. I mean, this is this is probably, if I had to guess, this is probably a five-year process, and maybe even as long as a ten-year process. I don't see it going much longer than that, because we're now getting into the we're now it's getting pretty interesting right now. I mean it. You know, the gold high of 2011 was around 1900 bucks. We're just below that now, 17, well, high 1700s today. You know, when we take out that 1900 bucks again, we're going to squirt up to 3000 in a, in a blink of an eye. And when that happens, a lot of people are going to wake up and go, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, we got to, you know, I get it. There's real inflation here. And at that point, look out because, that's that's what you said. Remember you said earlier your tipping point. Yeah, that's your tipping point. That's right. when the ten percent becomes everybody and their brothers. Like, well, do you own gold? Yeah. You know, how much gold do you own? Do you own gold stocks? I mean, you know, the way that everybody in the past twenty years, you know, remember when people those time they're talking about marijuana stocks, or there's time they're talking about, you know, Fang, or there's you know whatever the hot stock area was. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm having a hard time even believing this myself. But someday the hot stock area where people are going to be talking about on the street as well. You know which gold stock do you own? You know, I mean, I mean, can you imagine that? Because, because I mean, today the notion of that happening is just completely absurd, right? I mean, you know, people, I tell people I own gold or I own gold stock. I mean, my wife says to me, we go to parties. My wife says to me, 
please don't talk about gold. We, <laughs> <laughs> we want to have friends in this town. <laughs> and when you talk about gold, everybody gets depressed. I'm like, okay. I'll keep my mouth shut. I won't talk about gold. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know how you feel. Uh, before we wrap up here, Lawrence, maybe you could tell our viewers how they can learn more about what it is. Yeah, sure. Do. So there, there are two ways. I, I recommend people follow me on Twitter because I everything I've discussed here, I try to talk about on Twitter. So it's just my full name on Twitter. So Lawrence, L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E, Lepard, L-E-P-A-R-D, just mashed together as one word on Twitter. You'll find me there. And then I also have a website. My firm is called Equity Management Associates. Um, but the, the quarterly letter I'm referring to, all my quarterly letters are on that website. You can print them out and read them. They're free. Um, and so to get to that website, you go to EMA, Edward Mark Alpha, the number two dot com. So EMA two dot com. And you'll find the quarterly letter that I referred to in the, in the discussion. Perfect. Well, what I'll do is I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes, um, the description of this video. So anybody that's interested, click on that Great. and visit uh, Lawrence's website. Yeah, um, if people have questions, feel free to reach out. I try to respond to as many folks as I can. And I'm just, my view is my role at this stage is to try to help people through this because it's going to be kind of difficult. But, but there, you know, they're, they're, there's a bright side to it because we will get to a much better system. I mean, the system we're in right now, it's kind of broken, indeed. you know, and it's hurt a lot of people. And we need to, we need to have it totally break. And then we'll, then we'll come back with a better system based on sound money. And, and that's, that's something to be very positive about. I mean, I'm, very hopeful for my kids and someday my grandkids because I want to see the system get fixed. So fantastic. Lawrence Lepard, thanks for joining us on Goldcore TV today. Thank you, Dave. Really enjoyed being with you. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed this video, you're sure to enjoy these interviews that I've done with some other industry experts. And remember, if you want to see more interviews with industry experts and thought leaders in financial markets, subscribe to Goldcore TV and hit the notification bell now. And if you want to learn more about how to buy, sell, and store physical gold and silver, log on to goldcore.com, your precious metals experts.